<clears throat> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let us worship the Lord as he has given us an opportunity so we can come before the throne of grace. We enter into co in his courts with the praise and engage with the thanksgiving the Lord. And we sing a song in Christ alone. My hope is found. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, from through the fierce drought and storm. What heights of love, what depth of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand, in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my love, my, my hope, my love, in Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on their cross. His body, Jesus died. The wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I stand. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, my comforter, cornerstone, the solid bone. From through the fierce and rod and stone, what heights of love, what depth of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. There in the ground is body laid, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, sin curse loss has prayed for me, for I am his and he is mine, brought with the precious blood of God. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life for us, from from life for Christ to the final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man. Can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or call me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Here in the power of Christ I stand. He is my law, he is my strength, my light and song in Christ alone. My hope is found in one Christ of love I stand. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this privilege that we can come before your throne of grace. We can enter into your courts with the praise and into your courts with the praise and into gates with the thanksgiving, O Lord. 
Thank you for this wonderful opportunity that you have brought it to your servants that here today to deliver your word, O Lord, today, which has given it to me by you, Lord. I'm asking that come and fill me with your spirit, Lord. Holy Spirit, come and pour down onto me, Lord. Open my mind, my soul, my brains, fill with your spirit, Lord, and my brain with the word, the wisdom, the knowledge that I might not speak. You speak through me, Lord, that I am your humble servant that you have called in and you given this opportunity so I can speak about your words and try to make it sound like you speaking through, through me, through your people's Lord. Father, I'm not worthy, but you are worthy. But yet you have called me in and let take uh, let take the charge and you are in charge for my mouth, my tongues and my brains, my everything, Lord. And give me the word and the knowledge and let me see in the Father's hearts what is in the Father's heart so we can be able to uh, speak and I can able to speak, Lord. You can speak through me, Lord. Again, I give you all the honors, the glories and praise and seeking the wisdom and knowledge and discernment from you that whatever you have spoken to your peoples in the past and you continuously to speak to us, Lord, today. So your words and your words are, uh, are the direction for our feet, Lord, direction for our life, Lord. So we can listen to your voice attentively, obey and walk with you, God, our Heavenly Father in Christ. Amen. The scripture has given it to me today that having uh, the scripture is a second Corinthian verse seven to one. Paul is talking to the church of Corinthian. He's writing the letter from the city of Macedonia. So he's saying, having therefore these promises dearly, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So when Paul is speaking to the church of Corinthians, I always say it is a Paul hardship and joy because his joy was in a hardship and seeking from the Lord and speaking to the people and bringing them into the kingdom of God. And Paul ha always has a tough fight, uh, you know, the spiritual fight. He's dealing with this, so many tribes and so many grief and so many people. So when Paul is saying that having these promises, having these promises, promises, therefore having, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. So Paul is, um, Paul is calling, uh, you know, he's telling us our hope is in the holiness. So the topic would be from this verse would be the hope in the holiness. And secondly, obtain holiness for divine promises of God or the divine privileges of the God, which is in a possession. We are called to purity, number three. We are called to purity or called for eternal inheritance of God after obtaining the holiness of the God, after attain. So we have to attain the holiness. So this letter was written when Paul it was between in the 50 and 57 AD. And during the Paul's first and second evangelicals uh, missionary journey in Greece, which was between, which as I like said, which was between 50 AD to 57 AD. Paul is in the city of Macedonia in the northern city of Greece, which is the northern city of Greece, writing this letter to the church of Corinthian. The Corinthus, the city of, which is called Corinthus, the city, the Corinthus, the city of Roman fourth province, province of Achaia. Paul is writing this letter to the church of Corinthians to receive God's divine promises, which is the joy of believers daily life. So this for Paul is speaking to the present time and to the Romans, the Greek peoples, you know, and we know the times of the moment and the time, you know, how much the people was the, the you know, was away from God and what was their lifestyle would be. So as we are reading today, Paul's scriptures to the church of Corinthians, not just writing to the church of Corinthians, and Paul's letter, the Bible words, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, which is written to us, not for those presently people. They are far for the old generations to come through this letter. Paul is also reaching for 
far more to all of the believer of the Jesus Christ and the generations to come until hold on, hold on. Reaching to the more, let's go back. Paul is, through this letter, Paul is also reaching far more to all of the believers of Jesus Christ and the generations to come until the end of the Satan's reign on the earth, until the end of the world. So unless he's speaking to all the believers, not just to me, not just to my listeners, he's speaking to us, the believer of the Christ. Paul is writing how to attain a holiness as God is. He wants us to come back into the same holiness and be the holy temple of God. So he is telling us how we can attain the holiness and how we can receive those divine privilege or divine glorious privileges, which is God given it to himself. He's spoken himself. And by uh, cleansing, and what is, is as God holy? Number one, by cleansing our unholiness the church encounter when paul is talking to the church of corinthians there was a, some an issue of unholiness uh, holiness there was an issue of some false prophets into the church who was who was harnessed to the unholiness so the church was like a, into into that state you know when there was a false prophets into the church and there was you know, unholiness, they were harnessed unholiness un, un, among the unbeliever. So they were building the relationship. The church was building the relationship and he was, uh, uh, they were doing, uh, they were having a yoke or harness to the unbeliever in the building relationship, It, which means there was a false prophets into the church. And Paul is bringing attentions to the church, you know, go back and listen what we have to go, what we have to do, because uh, unholiness and holiness does not go along and false doctrines and the god's doctrines these are two different things and they don't go along and obtain you cannot by doing that you cannot obtain the god's glorious privileges unless you cleanse yourself so the secondly the second the third is the church of the corinthians the same way the church of corinthians was a quick and saved people they were just barely there were the, all the Roman and Greco and the Roman pagan Gentiles and much more. There were more tribes and more people. There was a much more people. And I would say, you know, this, Paul is stepping into the second Saddam and Gomorrah times, which when, when the time was the Roman government over the over or was under the Roman government. And there was like a Greco Roman government, and there was a Greco Romans, pagans and Gentiles and Hebrews. They all were into the church of Corinthian. And Paul is saying that to the people who are just quick and saved people who was just bought by the God's blood. They were newborn babies who required constant, constant of soft food and the milk, you know, to grow up. So he's talking when he's using this language, he's stirring up, you know, when Paul, the language of in this verse, Paul is giving a first thought which he gives to stir up in the godly ambition that he's trying to stir up the church they're trying to remind them you know you know what is what is a relationship for the holiness and unholiness you know why god is coming and giving his blood for that he did not give the blood to go with the holiness and unholiness because unholiness does not stand with the gods okay so god is holy so you have to be holy temple of the god as cg spurgeon saying in 1911 at the new intense uh, he's talking to the people when he's giving this uh, uh sermons in 1911 spurgeon he's saying the christians through jesus christ are receiving possession of most glorious privileges, divine promises of God. So we these these are the glorious privileges we have in the Christ. We are quick and say people we have in the Christ in Christ. And the Paul is speaking to this uh, uh, quick and say people. What lucky we are! What lucky people we are! No labor for earning such glorious privileges, divine promises of God, but by His own blood, which is according to His own will. 
we are called to receive blessing, but not until we purify from our flesh and spiritual filthiness. What is the condition here? The condition is here, we cannot receive those glorious privileges. We are the quick and saved people to Lord, and he bought us with his blood, the, son, uh, the blood of his son. We did not earn these promises. We did not receive these promises in the first place, but they are coming to us. They are coming to us, you know, through the through the Jesus Christ, and God is buying the people, all other nations, many people through, you know, with his blood, with his son's blood, to be his inheritance, and wants to keep those promises, divine promises, with us, and wants to be our God, which is according to his own will. We are called to receive blessing, but not until we purify from our filthiness unholiness, which is the flesh and the spiritual filthiness. By such words, having therefore these promises, Paul is saying these promises are in the possession when he's saying that by, by having therefore these promises, when he's using this term, he's saying that these are the promises which are the possession mean they are there before you guys who are just say quick and say people they belong to the Jews and Jews and they have been the God has these promises with them 2000 years ago before you even God chose them so these prom having these promises mean these promises are just not the newly promises through the Lord Jesus Christ. These promises are still in a possession. These are the possession of the Jews people, which belongs to the Jews people. And now it is to all the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ that God has opened the door to the, God has opened the door when he's talking, talking that he's saying that God has opened the door to the Gentiles, and he has. Opened, let's go back. He said, "But when I arrow my um, down my computer, it goes quickly on the top. So that's why. Sorry, bear with me. So Jesus Christ, God has opened the door to all Gentiles in the Jesus Christ to have a thousand blessed promises in the enjoyment of which they daily live, because our daily live enjoyment is in the God promises." with the God presence and in God. But we cannot receive the God unless we obey and unless we see what he wants us to do first. We have to do some work before we get those promises. So again, what I say, we are lucky people. We have, no done, we have done no labor. We have done nothing in all our life to earn such these glorious privilege, divine promises of God by by his own blood, which he shed his blood onto the cross. And she, he, par, he purchased us. He, he shed the blood for all mankind. I said it above, and I'll say it again, which is that according to his own will, are called to receive blessing, but not until we purify from our flesh and the spiritual filthiness. Let us see what are the filthiness of the flesh. So let's talk about, let's say, you know, what the God is talking about, what Paul is saying, our spiritual filthiness and the flesh filthiness. What is he saying? What is the meaning by that? Because he wants us to cleanse ourselves, make us purify ourselves, sanctify ourselves first before we receive those glory, glorious privilege or divine promises of the God. He's saying that, which is which is, is calling, this is the hope, you know, a whole hope, there is no hope unless we cleanse ourselves. So our hope is in the holy, hope is in the holiness, hope in the holiness. So he said, you know, you cannot receive these promises unless you sanctify yourself and unless you, become holy like a God is holy or be the holy temple because God is calling you to be a holy temple. So let us see what are the filthiness of flesh and the spirit which Paul is talking about. We need to cleanse ourselves, which we need to cleanse ourselves. So all filthiness and unclean things of the flesh that the Paul has already described in the Galatian church, chapter 5, 19 to, verse 19 to 21, he's saying that 
are evident. He's saying that now the work of the flesh are evident, are evident sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, uh, re dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So we all know the sexual immorality, which is the sex out of marriage or the same sex marriage or otherwise, we would say the marriage to other than out of your uh, marriage bondage. If you're having a sexual relationship with any other kind of people or male sex, male to male, women to women, or out of your marriage, that's a sexual immorality. This is the fleshly filthiness. The second is sensuality, whether whatever makes you physically good. Some people, you know, you know, uh, they do some things to make them a physically, uh, give them a physical happiness. You know, that's the sensuality. That's the physical uh, unholiness. Enmity, when you have angers or bitterness or agreement and you always call for fights, quarreling or fighting with other people. Valerie's struggles, discord, which is also another filthiness of flesh. Jealousy, envy is a jealousy, which is a filthiness of the flesh. Orgy, when you go into the drunk party and get drunken and do some other inappropriate sexual activities, that's called orgy. That's a filthiness of the flesh. And there's much more is Paul. And also the Paul is saying, these are all the filthiness of the flesh. Abstain and cleanse yourself from these fleshly desire. And the spiritual filthiness. What are the spiritual filthiness? Whatever we having the, the evil thoughts in our mind, our brains and our spirit, that's what the filthy thoughts. Okay, and the spirit filthiness of any men or women do directly. He's saying that any any human kind, any human kind, whether the women or the men, do directly or indirectly, which are the idolatry or adulterous, as Paul said in a Corinthian, First Corinthian, chapter six, verse nine. He said, "Or do you not know?" that the wrong doors, the criminal, which means the criminals will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. He's saying it, do not be deceived by doing all those uh, spiritual filthiness, by having a spiritual filthiness. You think you will enter the kingdom of God? Being a criminal or committing a crime or any felonies or any misdemeanors, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Neither the sexual immoral, nor the adulterers, nor the adulterers, nor men who have sex with the same men will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is the spiritual filthiness. The number second the spiritual filthiness example, there's a Bible verse in Matthew. When Jesus is saying in a Matthew 5, 28, he said, Jesus is saying in a Matthew about spiritual sins. Like we said, Jesus said, I came to shorten the, sh I shrunk the door away to come to the kingdom of God. Because if you commit anything in your thoughts and mind and soul, you have done it. This is the spiritual filthiness. He's saying, but I say to you that everyone who looks at the woman with the lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You have to cleanse your mind, your soul, your heart. You have to have a pure thoughts towards other human being. You have to have a pure, not the negative, not the evil, not the evil thoughts in your brain, okay? So when you do the spiritual, when you're thinking some evil thoughts about your other loved one or the brothers or the sisters are saying something, which is like a, a say, you know, in the mouth, in the on the mouth you bless, but in the heart you curse. So when, if you, when you're saying the curse in your thoughts or something, there's a spiritual filthiness. He said, but I say to you that everyone who looks at the women, Jesus is saying that, you know, when you are being married or unmarried, if you are looking some women or the girls with the filthy thoughts in your heart, you already committed a sin. And the second example is John 
first john chapter 317 say but if anybody has if anybody has the world a goods and sees his brothers in need yet closes his heart against him how, how does god love abide in him when you say you know i follow jesus i baptize in jesus but yet you have all the knee all the good things in your life and the good 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 and good goodness of the world in your hands this is a saying that you know but if you see your brother you know who has no food who has no clothes and you close your hearts and close, shut your door and you know that you know what is like a, against that against him and if you even say a bless if you pay the blessing and do not do in action you know you did not do anything that's a spiritual that's a spiritual of filthiness him and does good loves abide in him so that mean like it's god's love not abide in us so god loves abide in us way the way god wants us to if you see our brothers and sister you know they are in a need we have to help them you know how much we can help you can help them there are the spirit filthiness which makes us unclean and unholy we only can obtain God's high promises with the crown of glory. In order to receive, we must perfecting ourselves in the fear of God, which leads to the perfections. So we can perfect. He said, perfecting yourself in the fear of God, because the fear of God leads to us, lead us to in a perfection. Okay. Now we will see. So now we can see what Paul is talking about, having therefore those promises. What promises is talking about? Those are the promises which is he's saying that we have in the possession which belongs to the Jewish and they have, the God has promised with them before you, to, before even Jesus Christ come to them and they belong to him and they are coming to you through Lord Jesus Christ. What lucky people we are. So let us see what are the divine privilege or the divine, the glorious promises of the God, the glorious privilege we can receive through the Lord Jesus Christ as his believer and follower. So 2 Corinthians 6, 16, Paul is saying about the God's those, the God, which is the divine promises of the God to his people, you know, what God wants to do and in order to get us back and mark us holy temple of God, then we can receive those promises, which God's already promised with the nation of Israel before bringing us into the kingdom of God through the, through his son blood or purchasing, purchasing us through his son blood. So Corinthians, second Corinthians verse six, uh, six uh, chapter six, verse 16 saying, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Paul is saying that what is your agreement when he saw in the church of Corinthians, he said, what is your agreement being a son, being the temple of God with the idols, you know? Because you are the children of the living God and the living God and the idol does not go together. Because if you want to be the holy temple, then follow the holy, follow the holy God. Worship the living God who is the holy of holy. And obey him and listen him and ask him to cleanse you and cleanse yourself and do some effort and then he will fulfill his divine promises within you. For you are the temple of the living God. He's saying that when you are calling yourself, you are not the living the temple of the living God. If you are worshiping the idols, what is the what is the business with with the God and the idol? There is no business. There is no coordination between. They are not equal. Okay, you worshiping the idols. They're not living because they don't promise to you. The living God is the one who watches you take care of you. And he's the one who has divine promises. He wants to give it to you. But you have to come out from this idol worshiping. And you have to cleanse yourself from the fleshly and the spiritually unholiness. As God has said. So let's see what the promises he's talking about, which is already in a possession. The God promised with the nation of Israel. And to us today, through Lord Jesus Christ, he said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will they shall be my people. These are the four divine promises of the God Paul is talking about, which is in the possession. The God has made these divine promises with the mankind. As long we follow him, you know, 
he will do these promises. These promises will fulfill within us because these are for our well-being. God is given and he's binding us with these four divine promises with us. These are the glorious privilege of the God. We have to have it, you know, but we cannot have it unless we cleanse ourselves. Okay, so let's see what they say. He said, you know, the God said, he said, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols for you or the temple of the living God as God has said, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So these are the promises Paul is talking about. So we're going we're gonna to see what the divine promises is or they. These are the divine or the glorious privilege of the gods, which we have to have it. If we don't have it, we don't have any partnership with the God. We not call for inherit, return inheritance. We don't become internal inheritance because God has done everything that he promised with us. He bind himself. He bind himself with those divine promises with us. Like, so I will dwell in them. He said the dwelling in them. That means the wine dwelling in dwelling in us. God wants to be dwell into us. So let's look at the look at more furthermore. You know how God the wine dwelling will be in us. You know, the, he's saying that you know the, you Christians people are very privileged. The Christian church is very privileged. The follower of the Christ, they are very privileged that a God has been pleased to make the bodies of his people to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we are such a privilege. We are the lucky people through the Jesus Christ. We receive and we become the holy temple of the God when the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. When God comes and lives, how God is living into us, how he's, how he make it so easy for us to have uh, his, his dwelling in us. He said, divine in dwelling, which is I will dwell in them. How God will dwell into us. At this very moment in every one of us, Holy Spirit is living into us uh, in the, through the Lord Jesus Christ. That at this very moment in where every one of us who have put our trust and the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then his deity resides into us. That means God lives in us. When Jesus lives in us, God lives in us because Jesus effectively replaced, God effectively replaced himself living into us. When Jesus lives into us, God is living into us. Replace the need for the tabernacle. Tabernacle mean God is residing into us. God is coming into us. God is tabernacling within us. He's dwelling in us through the Lord Jesus Christ, through me, when Jesus Christ is living into us, when we follow Jesus Christ, the God, Jesus, God who replaced himself in the form of Jesus Christ and his son, when his son lives in us, then we have a God dwelling into us. I mean, God replaced himself as a Jesus to live in us. Anyone of us who is the believer of Jesus Christ is the dwelling place of God, is the holy temple of God. When Holy Spirit comes into us and lives into us and let us walk in the spirit, and then we cleanse ourselves and we purify ourselves because Holy Spirit help us to cleanse ourselves. So through the help of the Holy Spirit, Jesus lives in us. And then, you know, Jesus, dwelling place of God in Corinthians, as Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Paul tells believer that your body is the temple of the Holy Temple, Holy Spirit who is in you. So temple of the Holy Spirit, how can we become the temple, Holy Temple of God when Holy Spirit lives in us? So God dwelling in, in us, you know, it's not a temporary, it's a permanent permanent that Jesus Christ is going to live forever. He's going to, God's going to live among us through, uh, through his son. And Je when Jesus lives in us, God lives in us. He dwells not in the houses. He said that he, God does not dwell in the houses, but houses made by the hands of the man or building. He wants to dwell into us to make us a holy temple. By living into us, he will have a divine dwelling into us. Dwell within these holiness of clay tabernacle. He's not tabernacling. He wants to tabernacle into us. He wants to live in us. He wants to make us a temple, holy temple of God by living into us. Live in a, uh, uh, live in a living beings. He wants to live in a living beings who are us. 
who are we? Who are the living beings? We are the living being. This is the promise which we have actually obtained and are now positively enjoying, my brothers and sisters. So now, through the Lord Jesus Christ, we are enjoying this promise of the God doing dwelling when Jesus Christ is living into us, having Jesus as a God in dwelling in us through Holy Spirit, like I said, God is dwelling into us. First Corinthians 3, 16, uh, 3, chapter 3, 16 to 17, they say, do not know that you are the temple of God, that the spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone defies the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple are you? He's asking those people in you know, the Corinthian church, what temple are you? Are you the holy temple of God? Or are you the unholy temple of God? By worshiping the idols, you will not be the temple of God. Since God wants to make, wants to dwell into you, make you the holy temple of his, you know, through his son, when Holy Spirit, and uh, through the Holy Spirit, when his sons replaced, he replaced himself in Jesus Christ. And through the help of the Holy Spirit, he lives in us. When Holy Spirit is living into us, which is cl cleansing us, which is purifying us, which is helping us, which is interceding for us, which is he's showing us that Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is working into us, then we become the holy temple of God. Then God has a divine dwelling into us. Second uh, divine promise of the God, the divine uh, glorious privilege of the God, which is Paul talking about the possession of, which is in a possession, that is, and God walk among them and walk among them. God is promising that I want to walk among them, which means God divine's communion. God wants to communicate with us as he was communicating with Adam and Eve, as he was communicating with Enoch, as he communicating with, the, uh, with Abraham, as he communicating with uh, other uh, Noah, as he communicating with the other, other peoples, as he communicating with the Abraham, as he communicating with the, uh, 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 Moses, as he communicating with other people. God always wants to walk among us. That is one problem. He willingly wants to walk among us. He willingly wants to communicate with us. He's, he wants to uh, he wants to present himself into us together with uh, with our proper response to him with joy. God wants us to be in a relation with us. He wants to be in a relation with us. He's so humbly wants to be in relation with us. He wants to communicate with us. He wants to walk with us. That's why God wants us to cleanse ourselves and make ourselves presentable to him and be holy temple of the God so he can communicate with us and he can walk with us because he wants to be in a relationship with us. He wants to be in a relationship with us to have fellowship with us, not as God, but as a father, being a friend. God's plan of salvation shows how God is in the deep love with us, he has given supreme sacrifice for this divine communion in order to have a divine communion with us. We all know he gave his only begotten son to die for our sin and cross. Why? Why? Because God could not stand our separation from him. God suffered with empty home syndrome, which is in heaven. He could not stay in heaven. For that very reason, God has his redemptive plans in a place for forever. So through his son, Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can have a fellowship with our God. Who is our heavenly father in Jesus Christ? How can we have communion with our living God, who is three in one? who is three in one, which is the Father, God, the Father, the God, the Son, the God, the Holy Spirit. Our whole, our communion with the God to have relation with his Son, have faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then we receive our guardians, our helper, our teacher, the Holy Spirit, who is our helper. As Jesus said, John 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That means God will live with us forever through the Holy Spirit, through the helper, through our guardian, through the Holy Spirit. 
to have the Jesus Christ lived in us so we can walk and we can wear the Jesus Christ and we can wear him. But we can wear him and we can be like him. That's how God wants to have a holy communion. He wants to sending, he want, he's sending the helper of the Holy Spirit, which is, will be helping us to have a fellowship with the God, have the communion with the God, have God walk with us. This is how God made this very easy for us. What is so worthy in the earth to receive it? You know, the God's communicate communion with us. God lived in us. God communion with us. God walk with us. God talk with us. Every soul onto the earth and every single human, human being is thirsty for God is coming and talking and walking with them. But we are done to receive such a glorious promise of God that he will come and he wants to come walk with us he wants to walk with us he wants to talk with us like he was doing with the our uh, ancient for fathers you know our fathers in the bible those people the bible has given us the history is telling us how he was communicating father with the father abraham how he was communicating with moses how he was communicating with noah how he was communicating with enoch how he was first most of all how he was walking with, how he was communion, having communion with the, our uh, first parents, Adam and Eve. Every night, every evening, he was walking with them. He was having a fellowship with them. He was talking to them face to face. That's how God wants to talk to us face to face. So we have to cleanse ourselves. We have to read the word of God. So Gods can have a communion with He's talking to us through his the word, the scriptures. As John said, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he loves, he will keep my words. So through reading his words and obeying the word of the Jesus Christ, you know, God will have a communion with us. God will walk with us. We will, God will fulfill his divine promise with us. He said, Jesus answered in a John 14, chapter 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my words and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode with him. Because Jesus wants to walk with us. Not just Jesus. He said, if you obey my word, keep my word and obey my word, my father will love him. My father will love him. And me and my father will come and have a fellowship with you. And have a, will walk with you and have a communion with you. Communion means have a communication with you. We will talk, come and abort with you. Mean like we will sit down and sit down in the next sofa or sit down in the next chair and talk to you. That's how God wants to do it. That's why he wants us to cleanse ourselves first and be the holy temple of God. God knows his communion or his walk with us and is so important for our life that why he himself said, God is himself, God is so much in love with us. God in so much wants to have, keep a relation with us, maintain a relation, keep with us a relation. He's saying himself, he's saying himself, in you know, Revelation 3.20, he is saying himself, he wants us to invite him. He's standing at the door and he wants us to open the door and let him come in so he can sit with us and talk with us and eat with us, laugh with us. That's why he said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him. And he with me. What a promise. What, what this verse is telling us. This verse is telling us that God is eagerly waiting, standing at the door. At the knocking at the door. In our heart. He wants us to open our heart and let him come in. And let hear his voice and let him come in. And open the door. Open the door. So he will come in to him and will dine with him and he and he with me god wants to come and sit down on the table and have a dinner with us god wants to come in he wants us to open the door because he's standing at the door how much he wants to have a relation with us 
how much equally he's saying that. He does not say to anybody else. Did he, he promise to anybody else? Does he have a heartly desire to come and live with us and dine with us? Anybody else? No, other than his children, other than us. He want, He has a heartly desire to come inside and sit with us on the dining table and have a cup of tea. And we can have a cup of tea with the God. That's what he's saying that I am standing at the door and knocking at the door. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and I will dine with him. And he with me, my brothers and sister. What choice do we have? What are we thinking? Are we thinking somebody else to come and dine with us? Why cannot we have a desire as God has a desire to come in and have a dine? Why cannot we have that same desire as God has it towards us? Aren't we so lucky? We haven't done anything to earn these such a glorious privilege of the gods. But through his son, by his own will, he has a desire in his heart. He wants to live in us. He wants to walk with us. He wants to come inside the home and sit down with us and have a fellowship and talk face to face. And he wants to eat the food with us. He wants us to come and invite him on the table so we can have a dinner with him. He wants to have a breakfast with us. He wants to have a food with us. He wants to sit down onto the table and wants to dine with us. So then we can be his beloved children because that's how he's thirsty. Communion of the God walking is so important for our peace and joy in our life because God knows what is so important in our life. That is why he's so eager. That is why he has a desire in his heart. That is why he's thirsty for our communion, to have a communion with us, to walk with us, to make us his children, because he knows that without him, our life is miserable. We have no peace. We are in hell. If we are in the heaven, it's with the Father. We are in the heaven, it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in the heaven through the help of the Holy Spirit, which lead us to the God and show us the Father's love in his heart and to give us a peace and the joy in our daily life, which we witness and heard from our brother's keeper all the time as the scriptures say, which is, I say, the man is dead, sick and the dead, who has not have a peace and the joy of the Lord in the heart. God knows my children are sick and dead if they don't have my peace and my joy in their life. That's why God is so eagerly wants to have, dwell, wants to dwell into us, wants to walk with us, wants to talk with us, wants to come in the house inside and have a communion with us, have a talk with us, have to sit down and have a cup of tea with us, has to listen to us, has to take our burden on his shoulder. Give us a peace and joy into our daily life, which we already said. The scriptures say that what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you, my brothers and sisters. John is saying that, you know, in the chapter 1, 3, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have a fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. How important is uh, in, in our life to have a fellowship? God knows how it is important to have a fellowship, my, my children to have a fellowship with me. It is very important in our life. So my brothers and sisters, do not delay. If you still are waiting for other, uh, if you have uh, putting your hope into other do not. You are doing not a good favor to yourself. If you want to do a good favor to yourself, come back to the Lord because the Lord is worried about our peace and about our joy. He wants to come and live into us. He wants to live among us. He wants to talk to us. He wants to have a communication with us. That is why through, the, through his son, Lord Jesus Christ, through his son, because he wants us to have a fellowship with his son. 
when we have a fellowship with the son, when we follow him, when we wear him, when we talk to him, then we have a place in the God's heart because our place in the God's heart is there exist forever and it will be all the time because he has in the heart the desire that I should talk, I should come, and why would he come down and make these promises with us? Why he give us these divine promises to us? There's much more promises in the world for uh, in the blessed a thousand blessed promises in the Bible, but these are the four divine promises Paul is talking about. We cannot attain these promises unless we obtain. We cannot obtain these promises unless we attain the holiness. So our hope is in the holiness, which is the divine promises of God will fulfill. So as I said, the God loves to be in a relationship with us. And we can converse with him through prayers and reading the word of God. So when we pray, you know, he wants us to pray. He wants us to pray all the time. So when we pray and read the word of God, then we have a fellowship of the Lord. Then he tells us, you know, through his spoken word, which is alive, those words, you know, which becomes alive when we read and understand with the help of the Holy Spirit. So how important is the Holy Spirit to live into us so we can become his holy temple? That is the reason God wants us to uh, make us a holy because it's pleased him to make us every one of, make everybody to be his holy temple. This is what, because he knows that without the holiness, my children will not attain, my children will not obtain any of the promises of mine, which is I have it. And John 14, 23, Jesus answered that if anyone loves me, he will keep my words. And like I said earlier, divine communion of the God is our utmost need. So my brothers and sisters, the divine communion, the divine walking of the God with us is our utmost need for our daily life. Because we cannot survive on our own. Because he is, a, he is in control. He knows. His heart is very thirsty. His heartly desire, his heart is burning inside when we don't have, a, a, you know, when we go out of control and we go our own. His heart hurts. He hurts and cries all the times. He is. Because he is in control. And he said, out of the love, which is out of the love. This is the fragment of the grace of the God. That his heart is hurting all the time for us. And he's always worried about us. And he said, he's in a control. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul is saying that, you know, it's very simple. You know, we are lucky. He's so faithful to us. No, he sent his son. He kept his promises because he's so faithful. He makes things, he's making our life not miserable. He's making everything easy into our life. He's making our life to more easy and more accessible. That is why through his son, we have a fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. He's making very very simple, just putting our trust and having faith into his son and have a fellowship with him. Isn't that the very easy, 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 it's easy for us. It's easy for us. It wasn't easy for God, but he's so faithful and righteous God that he made it easy for us through his son that we can enter into the eternal glory we can receive the eternal privilege of god and we can be his righteousness and we can be we can be his internal inheritance eternal inheritance so spurgeon is saying ch spurgeon is saying communion of god is not merely a matter of promise to you and me, beloved, but we enjoy it now. I hope it has become habitual with us to abide with Jesus Christ. At morning break, we can frequently say, when I awake, I am still with you. And when the sun has gone down, we toss upon the bed 
and cannot sleep in the night watches our soul, talks with him whose eyes never slumber. Blessed is his name, who is Jesus Christ. Because our, our every moment of the life cannot go without knowing him, without him. You know, we cannot even step or one step without him. So in the morning, you know, we, we have to, in the morning we need him. And at night when we toss and turn into bed, then we need him. So we have to have a communion with him by prayers, by calling, by worshiping. And, you know, it's it's our utmost need is, you know, the communion of the God. We cannot survive without the communion of God. We cannot survive the communion of God, talking to God. Talk, God wants to talk to us, walk with us. Like when we come and talk to him, he wants to talk back to us. He tells us back, you know, he shows us a sign. He tells us a back and he gives us his holy presence there. And he does that. So number three, divine promises, God said, I will be their God. He's trying to be making a divine covenant. He's coming into, he's trying to make a covenant. He's divine covenanting of God, which is he will be their God. I will be their God. He's coming to make a covenant, bind a bondage between us. He's trying to set up a bondage between us by making a divine covenanting with us to be our God. When he said, I'll be their God. So then he's saying that, if you, you are come and I will bind an oath with you and I will be, a, I'm burdened to be your God because I want to be in a covenant with you for forever to be his inheritance. So with, we cannot be in his inheritance. God wants to make us his inheritance. That's why he said, I'll be their God when he is, our, he is going to make an oath with us to be our God as long we will obey him because he wants to be our God. He wants to be our God. He doesn't want us to be, uh, belongs to other God. He wants us to come where we belong. So he said, I'll be their God. So he will be our God for eternal inheritance, divine love of God that the covenant to love us and keep him, forgive us and through his son from generations to generations. This is his love, the love of the covenant of love, the covenant of love, because it's like God has forgiven us. You know, he had made the covenant through his son, you know, whoever listens to him, whoever obey him, you know, I'll be with them, I'll come and I'll live among them and he will make a covenant as the promise of God and I will be their God. He gives himself to his people to be there, to be theirs. How he gives himself by giving own sons, purchases by his own son's blood. Paul is talking far more to all generations to come as believer of Christ who will have joy of the Lord's in their daily life. Paul is saying God has, God has chosen us for his inheritance and granted us to be our portion, God has entered into the covenant relation with us. Now God has bind himself through his son, Jesus Christ, that to be our God for forever. When we have Jesus Christ and through the help of the Holy Spirit, God bind himself through his son. He put a permanent, a permanent bondage with us to be in a relationship with us through his son, Jesus Christ, to be his, for his eternal life, to be his uh, children, to be in his inheritance and granted us to be our portion. God has entered into the covenant relation with us. God bound himself with us by his divine promise and it is impossible for him to lie now. God promised which will never be broken. His promise is his own burden to his own to burden to be in relation with us. God himself, bind himself. He put us in a, with the bondage that he will be our God through his son, Lord Jesus Christ. His promise which cannot be broken. He burdened himself. He put the burden into himself to be in a relationship with, with us. God made an oath to be our and we will be his. The bondage, the oath, the promise which cannot be snapped, which it cannot be broken, which cannot be deleted. It is not the file or any link of the Googles which will be deleted. This is there for forever. He wants to be our God for forever by making the covenant through his son, Jesus Christ. 
which he will not violate. As he, as he, as, as King David say in Psalm eighty nine thirty four, my covenant I will not violate. He said to prom, he said, he said to King David, he said, my covenant I will not. God promises which he makes it there for forever. The covenant relation with the God, they are for forever. They cannot be snapped. They cannot be broken. They, because otherwise God will not be called a righteous God if he broken his promises to us. You know, who cannot keep his promises. My covenant I will not violate, nor I will utter the utterness of my lips. My spoken word, which is my spoken statement, my declaration. These are my declaration when I make a divine promises with you. And they will, I will not violate these. I will not change these whatever i have said it it is there it is there for forever and i will fulfill my promises as long as you obey and do what i say and that's how i keep my covenant there's a condition you know through his son he bind himself and he wants to be our god for forever so he wants us to why he's coming down and sending his son because he wants to be in a relationship with us he wants to be our friend. He wants to be our father. He wants to make us his, his, his eternal inheritance, his own children. The divine declaration is for forever. He said, you will be my people and I will be my, I will be your God. What a glorious prayer promise, divine promise of God. Moses spoke to Jews, nation of Israel and Old Testament in saying about the, what the God is saying that. Moses is telling over and over to the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant. What covenant he made it, he will keep it. Therefore forever. He will never broken. He will never change his mind. There's no second part in God's mind now. Those are written in a bold, in a black ink bold, and they are still, they are still, and they're gonna be remain still. They are still as at it is and has made it. It will never be broken. Who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to the thousandth generation with those who love him, which we all of us and keep his commandment. He is talking to all of us. We all have been caught, crafted and in, emerged into the God's divine covenant to be his inheritance through his only one, one and only son, Jesus Christ, who is between us now as a mediator of the new covenant of all mankind. So God has made a new covenant through his son, Jesus Christ, who become a, our mediator, who become between us and God, who is the way to the father. He said, therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant. Hebrews 9, 15 say, therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since the death has occurred that redeems them from the transgression committed under the first covenant. But the God is God covenant revision after when he made the covenant with the father Adam and Eve, you know, then, you know, he redeemed us. And then uh, out, out of the first tr uh, transgression, which was committed, committed in the garden either, and under the first covenant, he's redeeming us from there and he made a new covenant with us. He wants to be our God. He wants to dwell into us. He wants to have a divine communion with us, which is he wants to walk and talk with us. And he wants to have a divine, co he, want, he, he made a new covenant. You know, under new covenant, keeping his son as a mediator between us and between God to fulfill all our need and be our God for forever. And let us thank my brothers and sister, let us thank and summon our soul. Let us thank about from our soul and tell our soul that his, uh, the praise his name and we should praise the God's name. One of the blessing which was communicated to some of the past saints of nations. Because he's saying that let us thank God tonight and summons our souls to praise his. We are quick and say people. We should thank and praise him all the time. Because this is 
one of the blessings which was communicated to some of the past saints is talking about our ancient father, our fathers, which is the which is the nation of Israel. He's saying that through they did not perfectly understand and comprehend it. But Paul is making a sound that Paul is making a sound to us, to the new quick and safe people. He's saying it cannot you and I bask in the sunlight, light com uh, compared with which there was uh, but twilight, say we have obtained the promise. The invitation of God, divine covenant with all mankind. God is inviting us to be, have a divine covenant with us, to be our God, to have dwelling among us, to live among us through in the new covenant, through his son, Jesus Christ, who is our mediator between father, God and himself. So we cannot be saved. We cannot receive these promises uh, through unless we believe and trust and put our faith into his son, Lord Jesus Christ, and obey him as father wants us to obey him and cleanse ourselves. We cannot obtain these divine promises until we become the holy temple of God. So number four divine promises, Paul is talking about the, the fourth, uh, the privilege or glorious privilege of the God or uh, the divine promises, which is in a possession belongs to, like I said, in Jesus, uh, to the, our uh, old saint, which was the nation of Israel, which we would not, they did not understand and they did not keep uh, kept it. So now if God is changing, he changed the covenant and he made the new covenant through his son, he's coming to all the Gentiles and Jews and Gentiles to fulfill his promises. So number fourth divine promises is then he said, and they shall be my people. By saying that he is having a divine adoption. So this is a divine adoption of God for us by saying that they shall be my people. When he is saying that, he said, I will adopt them for forever. In addition to all this, have we have divine adoption. I will be a father unto you and you will be my sons and daughters. Thus say the Lord. Is this not our blessed state? Paul is saying that is not our blessed state. That he loves us with the Father's love, guide us with the Father's cares, protect us with the Father's watchfulness, instruct us with the Father's wisdom, bear us with the Father's patience, longs for us with the Father's longing. We are his tender children and he is our loving parents, mother and father. We become his children when we put our faith and trust into the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and ask for forgiveness of the sin and we come and obey him and then he fulfills his promises and then we, he has a thousand thousand blessed promises to fulfill which he, it's there for forever for us but we have to receive those promises. We cannot receive it because we have called into purity. We have to purify ourselves through his blood, through uh, wash our sin through his son's blood. And then, then God will fulfill. Then those having, therefore, those promises, which is the possession of uh, the God, which was given to the old saint, which is, I said that earlier, that those old, old saints, he's talking about the nation of Israel, which they did not understand and follow. That is why God revised the covenant. Now through his son, he's bringing us all into be his internal, eternal inheritance, his children. He wants to adopt us. He wants us to adopt us for his internal inheritance to be his children. How unspeakably great is the dignity of the Christian life? You know, it's unspeakable how much we are dignified in a God's eye. I mean, we were filthy. We never knew him. We didn't deserve him. We didn't earn these promises. We didn't earn these favors of God. But yet, that is a love. That is a, the grace, the fragment of his grace. That is his love. That he he's adopting us. He wants us to be his children. He wants to be our father. He wants to be our friend. 
if we look at in the, the light of these blessings before we understand it, how much we thirst after it. Because every single soul is thirsty for Father's love, for God's love, okay? The love of the creator. He make it available. He made it available. He made it very easy for us. We thirst after it. We thought when under conviction of sins, lived in a darkness and sinful life, he made that problems. He, he, he resolved the problem of the sin. He also resolved the problem of sins by forgiving our sin, by giving his son onto the cross. He resolved the problem of our past and the present and the future sin. But again and again, I said, we don't make a sin intentionally. If we made anything unintentionally with our thoughts and minds and souls and the brain and the action, you know, these are the sin of the spiritual and the flesh. He wants us to be abstained from it. Could we dare hope to among God's people? We have, we, do we have the hope? What we deserve, what we are. We are no compare, nobody compared to his love, what he's shown is nothing. But out of his uh, faithfulness, out of his righteousness, he did it. And he, he even made the promises. And he made everything available for us. Are we worthy enough to be called God's children, God's people, or his eternal inheritance? What we have done to earn, I like I said, what we have done uh, to earn such a blessings, divine promises from God, that is the holy of the holy, will be our father. When we think, when I think that my brain stopped working, I can, in a, 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 you know, when you, the new new believers come and when you see these promises God is making to them, you know, obviously your brain will be shut down and you will be in a, such a shock state that the one of the sinner, God loves us so much. How we value this blessing, are we are not apprised? This is a, we, we have prized by the favor of God. This is the favor of God, the favor of the Father, Heavenly Father. He prized us. According to his righteousness, by his righteous gestures and by his faithfulness. The Lord gives his people to know the value of this heavenly reality that's in an abiding sense of their calling and their standing. They may act in a way that is worthy of such great dignities. So when Paul is saying, having, having therefore these promises again, he's saying that he uses not the logic of the law. You know, there's no, you know, he's not using those uh, rituals, the Old Testament rituals, old our old father rituals, um, logics. This is the logic of love. This is the love of God. We have these mercies. We think that we have this mercy. We are so unspeakably favored. We are living in a daily enjoyment of divine dwelling, divine communion, divine covenanting, divine adoptions. And God wants to, he said, I want to be, I want to dwell in them. I want to walk with them. I, want, I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, he takes a step in advance and he's saying that cleanse ourselves. So that's why Paul is saying that, you know, let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. It is very clear the doctrine of the grace. You know, this is very clear the doctrine of grace, the faithfulness of the fathers and the fragment that they are of the privilege is of the Christians. They belong to Christians through the, his son, Lord Jesus Christ. Do not logically and spontaneously think, but they naturally and instinctively, lawfully and reasonably 
leads to the holiness of life. So my brothers and sisters, let us cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of our flesh and the spirit. What is the filthiness of our flesh? Our, our, uh, our action which will make us unholy in the, in the presence of God. And our spiritual, when we have an impure thoughts and mind and soul towards other and towards anybody. Cleansing away from impurity is a positive step and having fears of God lead us towards holiness. And we have hope of God, high promises. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, 16 to 18, what agreement therefore, which is already I said, you know, he said, what agreement we have between temple of God and idols, we are, for we are the temple of living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean things and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughter, says the Lord Almighty. Through his sons, we are called into the school of God's for purity to receive our glorious privileges, the promises of God. In conclusion, I will say the fact that we who are quick and save people, again, I said, in fact, that we are who quick and save people of God, we, God's blood, are absolutely and unconditionally favored saved and loved by God grace that our standing insecure that there we have become the children of God but the argument is gratitude in their heart obedience in their life as Spurgeon is saying in conclusion I'm saying it for for you what is obedience to God leads he said but the argument he's saying it in fact that we have our quick and saved God's saved by God's blood absolutely and unconditionally favored, saved and loved by God's grace, that our standing is secure, that we have become the children of God. But the argument is gratitude in the hearts and obedience in the life. What is obedience to God but the holiness? True obedience, uh, true obedience would be holiness and a perfection and the perfection comes in through the fear of God. Let us all cleanse ourselves from all the flesh and the spirit of filthiness so we can receive our glorious glorious divine promises of God. If we, have, we, uh, if we hope in a God as our Father, we must seek to be holy as he is. He is holy and perfect as our father in heaven though his grace by the influence although you know we are pure by his grace is unfit with his favored he fair undeserved for our undeserved favor he has given it to us you know absolutely by his grace but holiness should be our constant object you know the holiness is always should be our constant object in his fear in every moment in our life. My brothers and sister, God bless you all. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for those privileges, those promises that you have made and you kept in a promise, you kept in a possession with an old, our old fathers, which is the nation of Israel. And now they have come to us through your son, Lord Jesus Christ. We must, we must obtain, we must obtain Obtain those promises, Lord, in order to fill, fulfill, in order to get your divine promises fulfilled in us, Lord. Because you are willingly, you are willingly wants to come live in us. You wants to walk with us. You wants to talk with us. You wants to be our God. And we, you want us to be your people, your children's love. For therefore that you brought your son in between being our mediator, you slaughter him onto the cross, you shed his blood. So through his blood, we can be cleansed 
and under your fear we come into your holiness, Lord, to be your holy temple through the Holy Spirit, with the help of the Holy Spirit. And you make it so easily, easily for us, Lord. It tells us how much you are thirsty for our relation, how much you know about us, how much you know us. We don't know ourselves, we don't know our need, but by knowing us, you know, we have no knowledge, but you know everything about us. That's why you always worried about us. That's why you always coming with those divine covenant with us, with those divine promises with us. Because you know what is necessary for your children. You know the peace, without the peace and the joy of the Lord, we are sick and the dead. That's why, Father, you came and revised the covenant. And that's why you come into the covenant relationship with us. Through your son, Lord Jesus Christ, so we can be saved. We can call in a purity. We washed away our sins after redeeming us and bringing the salvations to us. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, you're trying, you're trying to make us, you are so pleased to make us a holy temple of yours so we can have the peace and the joy in our daily life. So we can have a fellowship with you and you can come in and drink a cup of tea with us, Lord. And thank you, Father, for making so such so easy for us, Lord. We cannot even bear one needle in needle prick in our hand, yet you have nailed on your sons onto the cross. You suffered greatly. You bruised greatly to have your children bags as your in, eternal inheritance, Lord. We thank you for everything, Lord. Thank you for the word I you have given it to me. Thank you for the wisdom that you have given it to me, Father. Thank you for speaking through me to your people's Lord. I pray may this, my speaking, which is your speaking, be blessed for many. And whomever listen this message today, Lord, it can touch and penetrate their hearts so they can think and they can come into, and then they can be your eternal inheritance too and they can be blessed and receive a 100% blessing from the, your words. And what I have you get what you have given me a wisdom now, wisdom today to speak, Lord. Let this be a blessing for all of us, Lord. In the mighty name of Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. God bless you all.